My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in Clearwater Beach for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased to have a second opportunity to speak with Kenny Deverne. I'm very pleased indeed, Mr. Dr. Rowe. Dr. Deverne. Dr. 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 Rowe. Dr. Deverne. And Dr. Rowe. Yes. Congratulations on your honorary degree. Thank you. It was yeah. a real honor indeed. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good weekend. I'm uh, looking at your whole career. It's a, it's a lengthy one, and uh, I'm expecting a lot more from you 10, 15, 20 years down the road, don't you think? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to make it day by day. Day by day. Uh, I don't buy any green bananas, <laughs> right. to quote Flip Phillips. <laughs> well, I had um, something I, want, I, I noticed <clears throat> in your last interview. I thought I would just start with this. And um, you had said talking about a person's, uh, the way they play and improvising a solo and so forth. What it boils down to is, can you sing through your horn? Can you sustain a melody and make it beautiful without all the gibberish and nonsense and trying to show everybody how many notes you can play around a melodic theme? Can you state simply the bare essentials of a melody and make it convincing? Yeah. Okay. I, I said that. You said that. Mm -hmm. Do you... Uh, have a problem with any of the more modern players who don't seem to I mean embellish think about on that? Um, on on the actual simplicity of the uh, of the of the of making a statement a melodic statement as as devoid of um, su superfluous uh, things <laughs> notes uh, gimmicks uh -huh. um, yeah I have a problem with them yeah. sure they bore me. They blur you. Uh, no, bore me. Bore you. They okay. bore me. Yeah. Uh, because um, Louis Armstrong was probably the you know the greatest exponent mm -hmm. of being able to play one note and making it have more meaning, you know, yeah. with a great deal of energy. Uh, just getting that timbre going on that note. Caruso could do it too, and uh, maybe a, a few others, but not many, it seems. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to take you back in your career a little bit. I'm trying to think now. Uh, you were born in 1935. Mm -hmm. So about the time as a kid when you were starting to absorb music around you, what was going on in your household that you were being exposed to? Anything in particular? Uh, nothing I can really remember because nobody in my family. I remember it was the height of the Depression, mm -hmm. 1930, uh, all the way till the Second World War. Uh, there was not much anything going on except my mother just related that I would bounce in the high chair when she turned on the radio mm -hmm. to the point where uh, I was so strong in the high chair <laughs> that, that she had wondered whether or not I was going to tumble onto the floor. Yeah. Which maybe. Uh, <laughs> Would have been a good thing. <laughs> no, that's you know that's about as much as I remember. Yeah. I remember also, you know, hearing, um, oh, basically the radio. That was probably the primary uh, yeah. um, listening device. And then I could just remember when I finally see. I was in nine foster homes before this age of six, so this wasn't much fun. Uh, you know. One didn't really think about music, uh, you know, between two and six, let's say, right? You know. I, I'm not sure if you're kidding. No, not kidding. You were in nine foster homes yeah, before the age of six. That's correct. Okay. Right. I had a very ambivalent mother. In fact, my wife and I uh, bought the uh, Sopranos series, you know, the, on HBO Sopranos mm -hmm. series, and it uh, turns out that I really have something in common with Tony Soprano, the you know, a.k.a. Uh, James, um, um, whatever his name is, he's very good. That we both had the same mother. Oh. Same mother. Mm -hmm. In fact, she even has the same voice. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, the poor woman who played Tony uh, Soprano's mother died over this uh, past summer. Yes, I that's right, Nancy Marchand. Marchand, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's very, you know, She's very good. She really knew. She, it must be a type that 
a lot of people have for mothers because when he wanted to smother her with a pillow, uh, <laughs> and they held him physically, you know. Yeah. Uh, she was in oxygen and they were wheeling her out on a gurney, smiling. <laughs> Right. Uh, so you asked, this is a, sort of a circuitous way of uh, answering your question, Monk, mm -hmm. about uh, what music did I hear as a kid. I can't say other than what was on the airwaves, mm -hmm. you know. But what was on the airwaves was, a lot of it was swing music? Oh, it was all that. You know, all that. Then again, there was a lot of tuba music, too. I mean, you know, big bands were was, was still carrying forth with tubas. I mean, Instead of the string bass? That's correct. Uh -huh. you know, a lot of big bands still had that going on. Wow. So and they were still doing the two-beat kind of thing? Absolutely right. Thing and sure. I mean, um, I, think, I think one of the big hits of the day, because I remember my mother singing this to me, was, Looky, 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 here comes Cookie. Uh -huh. uh, and then there was a, a very good film which grabbed me uh, later on in life that had... Um, oh, um, George Raff playing a good a good guy as a band leader wearing a white jacket called uh, every uh, every night at eight or something like that or, and Frances Langford was was the girl uh, singer with the band and she sang this one tune then you've never been blue which was really a wonderful tune you know and it's sort of like I still remember tunes like that you know and it was written by Herb Weedoft Rudy Weedoft's brother uh -huh. who was supposedly a trumpet player. It was a gorgeous tune, and um, I mean, you know, that's what I remember, sort of, you know. What put a clarinet in your hands as a young kid? The fact, one, I couldn't figure out how to play a trumpet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we couldn't afford a piano. That was my first love was the piano. Second, I wanted to learn the trumpet. I didn't know how you could get all those notes out of just three vowels. Oh. There's something wrong with that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, math was not my strong point. Okay. Then I heard Artie Shaw play the clarinet concerto on the radio. I guess this had to be about 1945 or six. And I fantasized, you know, with this instrument sailing over the whole band. And I liked that whole concept, you know. Plus it was made of wood, and which was a part of a growing tree at one time, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of romantic uh, ideas a kid might have. Uh -huh. And um, well, lo and behold, we got a clarinet, you know. Neat. But it was only, it was a $35 one at the time. Uh -huh. And it was a C clarinet and an Albert system. No kidding, a yeah. C clarinet. Yeah, and an Albert system. Uh -huh. And we couldn't find anybody to teach me because, you know, it's, it was an old fashioned system and yeah. uh, practically everybody played the BAM. And we did find an old Italian teacher on, uh, which was on, on, on the, the line where Brooklyn and Queens met, you see. His name was Mr. Bruno, Louis Bruno, mm -hmm. or Luigi Bruno. And he taught both systems, Albert mm -hmm. and Bayham system clarinet. Well, you eventually had to make a transition. Right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Right. At 13, I made okay. the transition. Yeah. And um, but I guess I must have spent maybe three years playing our no playing our system clarinet, which I later went back to, uh -huh. and then switched again. Okay, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. was he a typical? Um, this teacher was he a typical kind of taskmaster? Well, I thought he was. You know, at first, I mean, he'd tap the pencil on the music stand, and I'd play you know these different exercises mm -hmm. and stuff. But I would catch him sort of dreaming, uh, looking out the window while I was playing. <laughs> and if I didn't do my homework, you know, I would, I would improvise what I was, you know, the, the, I just kept the time going right. Yeah. And he wouldn't catch it. <laughs> so that's when I knew it was time to change teachers. When I said, well, hmm, this guy, he's not catching me doing all this funny stuff. See? But it was the beginning of improvisation for yeah, me. Yeah, it's good. You were starting <laughs> to take a ride already. A lot of these to call it faking it. In those You're faking days. it, I yes. I was faking it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. Yeah, that's neat. Did, was there a point? Um, where you said, I'm, music's going to be my career. Right. A definite? A definite, uh, I can remember it like it was yesterday. It was, there used to be um, Ted Husing's bandstand. Uh, Ted Husing, I think, originally was a, uh, 
uh, sports car, um, you know, enthusiast or whatever. Oh. Uh, and he had a, a, a sh he had he played popular music for like from three to six every day. I, I forget what the station was, WJZ or WOR, something like that. And the last 15 minutes, he played Dixieland band music, you know. And I was I liked that. I liked the way those bands sounded, you know. I liked it especially because the clarinet was free. And then on Saturday mornings from 11 to 12, he'd play a whole hour of all these different people, you know, Dixieland jazz bands, whether it be, you know, uh, Tony Parenti or uh, Wild Bill Davison or, mm -hmm. you know, who, you name it, and uh, whoever was around at that time. Um, and one day he played a Muggsy Spanier recording of uh, Muggsy Spanier's Ragtime, and they were playing um, Memphis Blues. And I was just standing in the kitchen listening, I remember, you know. And I heard this, it was because the radio was on top of the ice box, you know. And, and I heard this instrument growling and grunting and and this, and this beautiful background, like organ in the back of him, you know, a band playing whole notes. And it was Pee Wee Russell playing clarinet. Well, you know, you can go look at paintings, you can read books, you can see movies, you can listen to music. And if you haven't had a musical experience from any one of those things, you're never really going to be hooked. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if a book can make you laugh and cry, and the same with a painting or whatever, if you can experience something, well, that was, that exp I, you know, prior to that, you just listen. Mm -hmm. You know, like a, a, a fan. You know, yeah. yeah, that's good, yay. But if it doesn't really grab you emotionally, yeah. And I stood there, I remember, a transfixed, looking at that, you know, radio, and uh. I said, that's it. I want to do that for the rest of my life. Wow. I was about 14. That's a great story. Yeah, you know, so when I was 14, I would have been 19, oh, 35, 45, <laughs> 1949. Uh-huh. Just about to go into high school. And you'd been playing clarinet for a few years? About four years, yeah. three, four years. Uh -huh. I don't remember how serious it was, but I remember playing, you know, with a piano, playing the 12th Street Rag at a, at a, at a, at a, you know, in, but an assembly period, you know. Oh. And now, you know, now <laughs> yeah. we'll see The Heavens Are Telling by Ludwig van Beethoven <laughs> and to be followed by uh, John Kenneth Verne performing on the clarionet, uh, the 12th Street Rag. You know. <laughs> and I remember how awful it was trying to think of the Albert system playing because, you know, but de do de do do I, I, I got messed up. Whew. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, that, so when I went to high school, I was lucky to go out of the jurisdiction because I was, at that point, I was able to get into the music uh, course in Newtown High, which, uh -huh. because they had the only music academic school in the five boroughs in New York, um, I could get in, and I didn't have to go to one of those, you know, local high schools. Mm -hmm. And there I met Bobby Grosso, who was Joe Grosso's son, and he was like I think maybe three or four years older than me, and it was through Bobby that I met his father Joe, who at that time was working at Lou Tarassi's Hickory Log but had already made those wonderful Commodore records with Wild Bill and Muggsy and Pee Wee and all those people. And he was a regular guy, you know, over there. He was with Bob Haggart, you know, and uh, Miff Mole and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the people who, who mattered, George mm -hmm. Wetling, you know, guys who played the kind of music I liked yeah. at that time. Bobby Hackett played it better than, you know, they all played it better than anybody else. And, uh, and Joe, Bob, I used to eat at their house, and Joe would get up around noon, having worked the clubs till four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And um, he would get up and come out in his long silk bathrobe, holding a cigarette in a cigarette holder about that long, you know. And I thought that was the greatest life to be able to, you know, finish work at four o'clock in the morning. I said, that's what. Be careful what you wish for. Well, anyway, uh, uh, Joe used to take us down to the old Condens on West Third Street, you know, and. To see all those guys that you heard on records and mm -hmm. read about in the, the jazz magazines, you know, in person. And um, 
So I was lucky. I had my own jazz band in school, and yeah. Larry O'Brien was uh, in it. The guy now, I think he leads one of the Glenn Miller ghost bands, you know. Oh. Yeah, he's yeah. a very fine trombone player. Uh -huh. He was my hot jazz trombone player. Uh -huh. The guy who owned the Cork and Big, uh, Cork and Bib Club out in Queens was a high school buddy of mine also. Johnny Hurst played trumpet, and uh, Bobby Grosso played the drums, mm -hmm. and a few other people on bass and piano, respectively. The jazz life looked uh, glamorous. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I used to. We were the only music guys in that high school. We all dressed shirts, ties, suits, and we all carried our own little jugs in our in our. Oh, in no our, kidding. In our, yeah, you know, we were cool, man. <laughs> we didn't know about smoking pot then, you know, but we we knew about drinking. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> that came later. It came. <laughs> Not long later. Yeah, <laughs> later. you had to graduate. You have to that's go through it. the different levels. That's it, right, right. <laughs> the different sicknesses. <laughs> <laughs> I have a note here that you were you played with uh, Ralph Flanagan and Jack Teagarden before you were even 20. Yeah, I was. I just got out of high school for six mm -hmm. months. I could have gone with Shep Fields, uh, yeah, but I would have had to quit school. Oh, and, isn't he uh, the guy that did the bubble thing? That's it. That's yeah. him. Right. He had five clarinets, though. See, he had a more clarinet uh, band, practically. Oh. You know, and he would have bought me a bass clarinet. I went there and I passed the audition. He was going to buy me a bass clarinet and all that kind of stuff. But my mother and my, my teacher at that time said, my teacher was Joan, uh, was Joan Napoleon, who was Phil Napoleon's uh, uh, brother. And uh, there were th five brothers, of mm -hmm. which Marty Napoleon, Teddy Napoleon were... All, were Nephews. Okay, right. And um, he says, "Sonny, don't come for me for lessons if you go if you quit school," because he was a firm believer in getting your papers, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, we knew that was a joke, but it meant not having to stay in school, and I yeah. had a, I couldn't go out with Chef Fields. And um, he threatened to take me to the union. We all belonged to the union by the time we were sixteen. Oh. So um, my mother got on the phone and she said, "Mr. Fields." Um, do you realize that my son is a minor? And that was the end of it. Oh. Ooh. So you hadn't even told him how old you were? That's right. <laughs> 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 I just went up, see, I used to go up to Nola's studio where all the bands rehearsed. Oh, yes, yeah. a lot of people have mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we just used to hang around there looking at this. And see. You see Betty Goodman rehearsing, you see Artie Shore rehearsing, you see Tommy Dorsey rehearsing. And there was Shep Fields rehearsing. Well, I said, what harm could this do? You know, we, we, you know a sign out there, we, we need a baritone, uh, a baritone sax and bass clarinet, clarinet player. So, fine, boom, sat down in the chair, played. Oh, good, you're, what's your name, kid? Well, you're, and that's how I got with Ralph Flanagan. I was I finally graduated high school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I remember they're holding auditions. And word got around in all the studios, all the all the music studio, uh, student studios. You know, so and so was holding audition next Thursday, you know, four o'clock. You know, and uh, or so and so next 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 Monday, one o'clock. You know, that's such as a Hartnett studio on her. And uh, so they said, well, Ralph Fine is holding uh, auditions down in uh, Manhattan Center on, on 34th Street, um, 4 o'clock on Thursday, which is true. So I brought my instruments down, and there was a line of maybe, you know, oh. 25, 30 guys. It was a line. You know, you were next, you know. <laughs> So I saw this line, and I just walked right up to that. I said, who's the, who's the manager? I said, oh, that guy there, you know, George Thompson. I said, uh, are you Mr. Thompson? He said, yes, I am. I said, my name's Kenny DeVernon, and, and I can't wait this line. See, I have a gig, which I was lying through my teeth. I have to be at a gig in about uh, 45 minutes, and, and I wonder if it would be possible for me to st He said, okay. And he took me in. Well, there was, in the back of the screen, there was Ralph Flanagan putzing around on the piano and a bass player and a drum. And he puts up the sheet music, and I take out my horns. He's, it was the fifth baritone part, which was like minor seconds to the to the lead, you know, oh, right. <laughs> all the, the way through. The, the oddball harmony. Oh, exactly, yeah. right. You know, yep, up, way up in the high register. No problem with that. And the alto, the, the fifth part of alto, was also, you know, like uh, the joke, you know. What kind of harmony does he play? Oh, he plays. He plays. He plays the fifth alto part. You know. <laughs> uh, like, uh, so I, I did that, and I, and I found out that Ralph's theme song 
was Moonlight Serenade, because it was a Glenn Miller type band, was Moonlight Serenade the other way around, upside down. Like, you know, Moonlight Serenade, ba da 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 Took a deep breath and I played all the way up to the high register. Uh, okay, you know, and then fine. Next, he said that one. Hmm. We'll play Muskrat Ramble, okay? B flat, and he's blink, 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 blink. And we played that. We played That's a Plenty, blink, blink. Okay, we'll let you know. We'll mm -hmm. pack it up, boom. <laughs> and then you went to your supposed gig. <laughs> yeah, then I went to my supposed <laughs> gig, which went out to my friend's house in Queens where I had dinner, you know, and, and um, that night, Telephone rings about nine o'clock. My mother calling my friend's house. She says, you better get home right away. Why? You're leaving at 12 noon from in front of the President Hotel tomorrow. <laughs> well, boom. You know, away I went. Wow. Yeah. And about, I don't know, three months later, four months later, I came back. Like, if I went out weighing 130 pounds, I came back 116. No kidding. Yeah. We did uh, 61 nighters in 90 days. We made the most amount of money any band had ever made on a road. I think it was, uh, well, whatever it was. I don't want to quote any figure I'm not sure of. And uh, all the guys would come up to me and say, ooh, you know, wow, yeah. you have the big time, you know, big time I ass. I said, horrible. It was awful out there. You know, uh, shaving uh, on the bandstand before the gig, wearing, I mean, it just mm. wasn't... Tell me more why it was awful. Well, let's face it, uh, maybe you're driving through Keokuk, Iowa, <laughs> on the way to Ames. <laughs> well, maybe it was Ames on the way to Keokuk. At any rate, uh, the most you might see was a Stewart driving, a root beer, hot dogs. Now you'd have that and ice cream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back in the car, some more traveling. Get to this place, you're in your jeans and you're in, you know, and, and sort of like a man dressed now. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, it was hot. You know, cars didn't even have air conditioners in uh, yeah. 1953. Some did, but ours mm -hmm. never did. And um, you'd get there, maybe. Five, six o'clock, and you go, you know, you're right at the gig, at the ballroom. The ball is the ballroom. The ballroom is like on, on, on Highway 483, midway between, you know, Chicago and Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> and to shave, you had to plug in, there was one outlet by the bandstand. You plug that in, each guy would take a turn with his electric shaver shaving. Next. And then there was one, like, sink in back of the bandstand with cold water only and a naked light bulb hanging down and a cracked piece of a mirror. And that's where you washed up. Then you put on a shirt. Nylon shirts had just come out. short sleeve nylon shirts. And it was the summertime. Because, you know, you needed something you could wash out right away and hang up and dry. And cotton shirts just weren't it then, you know. I mean, you just could, you could do that, but mm -hmm. it wasn't really uh, practical. And... So, you know, uh, then these shirts were hot. I'm telling you, when you closed up that collar and you put on a black bow tie, which you had to make yourself in those days, you know, you know little, and then you put that, that wool jacket on over you, you know, and your tuxedo pants, you were roasting. Mm. And you did four, you know, four sets, four hour sets, and then you packed it up the horns and folded up the book and put it on the pile and packed up your horns and then they put them on the, on the, on the truck. And then you got in the car and you rode, let's say maybe 350 more miles. And you got to with the gig maybe, and you had to go through those towns at that time obeying the speed limit because they were all speed traps. And if you went one mile over, they grabbed you and you had to pay off, you mm. see. So all the drivers were aware of this, you know. And uh, a lot of times you almost got killed speeding on, you know, you know on three lane. The middle lane was for passing in either no. direction, you know, going okay. through. So it wasn't uh, like throughways and all that. No, we're not like throughways. Mm -mm. Wow.
So I'll finish with this road uh, yeah. travail. And um, like I said, one time I was, you know, you're dozing on the, I was dozing up, trying to fall asleep in the back seat of a, of a 1953 Buick. The, 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 what do they call it? The, you know, where that, where the hump is. The drive shaft. Yeah. The drive shaft. Well, it was, you know, the drive shaft was like, like two feet up, you know. So you had a, you had your, your knees in your, in your, in your chin. And two guys on each side of you. One guy, two guys up front. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, zooming along, all of a sudden you hear, oh, hold on, hold on, your ass, fellas. And you look up and you see two eight wheel, eight, eight wheelers, one on each side of you, one going this way and the other one going that way. And, you, and, they, and you're in the center of the two of these guys. I mean, very frightening. And a lot of guys got killed mm. in those kind of uh, uh, precarious road uh, driving things at the end. And then you get into the, where the town you're going to go, you know, you left at about 11, 30, 12, let's say. Maybe about 6, 30, 7 o'clock in the morning, you rolled into the other, the other great um, town where, which boasted of a Milner Hotel, 375 or 275 a night, I forget which. And you couldn't check in, you see. All right. So you'd have to put your luggage, you know, in the bell captain would take your luggage. These are very cheap hotels. And then you'd walk around town. You'd have breakfast in one of those um, do drop in places. <laughs> Maybe visit the local music store to see what kind of instruments they had, because good horns were still relatively easy to find, premium horns. Uh -huh. Of course, we don't have any money, but if we needed it, we would, we would borrow whatever. And. Um, then when you checked in, maybe at 11, 12, or 1, you know, you may have gotten a haircut, whatever, anything to kill some time. You slept till about 5 o'clock, and that's when, you know, had your wake-up call, you got dressed, you shaved, you showered, and you went down to the, the local buffet, uh, you still, well, cafeteria style, you know. Right. Right, yeah. and you had uh, spaghetti, or you had whatever, you know, depending on what part of the world you're in. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then you went to the gig, and that night you were able to stay over. But you left 9 o'clock the next day because, again, you had 350 miles to go. So, you know, you do that. Day after day. I was, yeah, it was really quite, quite hard. But, you know, as a kid, you don't care about that. Mm -hmm. I think I made, I was, I made 120, pay was $125 a week. Mm -hmm. I cleared $117.50. And I could save money, Yeah. believe it or not, in 1953. Because the rooms, two dollars meals weren't that, that weren't that expensive. Right, every other night was two seventy five, yeah. or maybe three dollars, or maybe what we. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, that experience may have put some perspective on things for you. I expected much more from, <laughs> from then on. I just got very, you know, I said. Yeah. Uh, when I came home, like I said, all the guy, oh boy, they're all, I uh, starry eyed and I thought I'd be stage struck. I said. Why was it? It was the fucking worst, I said. You know, yeah. Plain and simple. It was the fucking worst. Oh. Well, they were all, they all wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'd done it, you know. And I just, I, so I just didn't see any romance in that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I quit him for six months and rejoined him a year later. I was one of the only few guys to ever rejoin him. You know, even mm -hmm. when you left that band, you left. <laughs> And then I joined Jack Teagarden uh, while I was still with Ralph at the Hotel New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And, Ra and uh, Jack was holding auditions out in uh, the Meadowbrook. And at the Meadowbrook, I um, joined up with him. And Ralph, I remember walking in, you know, he let me take off. It was a matinee, and I came in about 7.30 after I got back from the Meadowbrook. They had had a matinee there. So <clears throat> I came in, and Ralph was conducting, you know, he looks at me, he sees me coming through, and he says, how did you make out? And I says, I made it. He says, they need a piano player? I says, you, I says, you got your own band. He says, this pile of shit. <laughs> <laughs> right from the band stage, says, this pile of shit, he says. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he, was, he was trying to give away his piano. <laughs> yeah, he he, he wanted out this. of it. He wanted out of that band. He'd had it by then, you know. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was a marvelous guy in his own way. That's funny. Yeah. A lot of guys were frightened to death of him, they, you know. But he was a big money maker, and, uh -huh. and it was a good band. We, we had section rehearsals and stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of guys didn't like that kind of music. Well, neither did I. 
Yeah. But I was a hot clarinet player. Uh -huh. I enjoyed the last 15 minutes oh. playing with a trio okay. or quartet. That got me together. Yeah. I was going to say, when you went and made a move to Jack Teagarden, you have to play a lot more from your ears. Right? Yeah, but that's what I always wanted to do anyway. Right. I'd had a lot of uh, experience doing it, sitting mm -hmm. in and uh, with other bands, you know. I mean, uh, before I went on the road with, uh, with, the, with the Mickey band, so to speak, you know, yeah. I was always, I learned the, the repertoire thoroughly, you know, all the harmony parts, all the mm -hmm. what have you, you know. Yeah. I mean, so it wasn't like I was stepping into something uh, that was foreign territory okay. to me. Yeah. Mm. The whole, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the kind of thing that happens on the bandstand, the etiquette, is really interesting to watch, even besides the music. You know, who solos when and all that. Mm -hmm. I really find that fascinating to watch. And you did something last night I was watching from outside the window. I think it was last night. That I had never seen before. And? Uh, somebody was soloing, and it was coming to the bridge. And you went like this. Man, whole notes. Yeah. Footballs. I had never seen that particular gesture before, and everybody knew what to do. Mm -hmm. To just play whole notes as a background. That's correct. Is that something that's been, I mean, that and all those other things have been around for... Everybody has their different signals, you know. Yeah. Um, this means back to the bridge. This means to the bridge? Right. Or it could mean, in some instances, theme song. Okay. T. But in a jazz band, that would mean bridge. In some circles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> An example how that could get <clears throat> screwed up was Henry Red Allen, who loved to work in a quartet format, um, went out to Detroit to play a club. No, it was Cleveland. Went to Cleveland to play the Theatrical Lounge. And he had locals. And he was playing a tune, Rosetta or whatever it was, and they want to take it out. So he yells, George Washington! And, you know, the band comes back and finishes the last date, and it goes right back to the head, or the top, and he's at the bridge. Okay. <laughs> Complete train wreck. When it, was, when it was all over, everybody sort of caught up to each other. He says, I told you George Washington! And they looked at him and said, what the fuck is George Washington? He says, the bridge! The bridge! Well, they never heard of George Washington right. Bridge in Cleveland. <laughs> So there, right. there, Monk, is an example right. of how that should get completely <laughs> yeah. turned around. Yes. <laughs> I heard Claude Fiddler Williams once. He goes, Channel. Oh, it's Channel. Yeah. A channel. I had yeah. never heard that. I have heard the Channel. Okay. Yeah. Channel, you know, the Channel, right? <laughs> under the water, <laughs> over the water, whatever. Bridge, same thing. Yeah. Channel, under, bridge, <laughs> over. Uh, George Washington. That's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Wow. Um, all, who are the Salty Dogs? Well, it's made up uh, of a group of guys who had the oldest uh, traditional, or longest lived traditional band going in New York City at that time, uh -huh. which was basically the Red Onion Jazz Band. They were a group of scholars, you know, I mean, uh, they, they taught, they were Columbia professors okay. you know, and stuff like that. And they played because they loved music. Right. They loved the King Oliver Band or they loved yeah. uh, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings, you mm -hmm. see. And at that time I was going through a learning process or relearning or unlearning process mm -hmm. of wanting to uh, explore the possibilities of what, well, what were those New Orleans guys? What did it feel like to play hymns, you know, and stuff like that? And I had a group of guys who also loved the same kind of music that I did. And at that time, I was playing at Nick's in Greenwich Village. And we used to be called, you know, that slick Italian Dixieland band, you know. Yeah. Nixieland band. Nixieland. Yeah, it's called yeah. Nixieland uh -huh. music. And, um, and this, was, uh, uh, this was like our sort of version of a New Orleans revival band that, that was happening in Britain. You know, at that time, Monty Sunshine and uh, Chris Barber and, uh, you know, all those guys. Kenny Ball, 
big hit they had over there. Oh, Came yeah. here too, Midnight, Midnight in Moscow, Moscow, stuff like that. Right. And so this was about 57, 58. And we had our own little band, and we did this kind of same kind of expectation, same kind of feel. And uh, we played, you know, like country clubs playing uh, old gospel uh, music, mm. kind of you know, hymns, you know. Lord, 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 you sure have been good to me. Walking with the king, you know, just a little while to stay here, you know, stuff like that. That they're still making a, a career of in New, in New Orleans now. Yes. You know, they, they, I mean, it's so hokey, it's ridiculous. But we had one, you know, just at that time. And I would take this recordings I had, you know, Wooden Joe Nicholas and Night at Artesian Hall with Albert Burbank and Big Jim Robinson and all these people, baby dodds, played for the guys that I was working with. It was very, very esoteric. Uh, well done, well played, Nixieland band. You know, we really played the, played those classic jazz band things, to a turn. And this was really rough music. I played it for these guys, and they all looked at me like I was crazy. You like that shit? <laughs> I say, yeah, I love it. Oh man! But at the same time, I was listening to the Goon shows on WBAI, and I was roar roaring with laughter, not really understanding what they were even saying. But the way in which the, the rhythm was so good, you know, with Sellers and uh, 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 um, company, you know, the, the Goon Show. Did you ever hear any of those? Oh, is that um, with Sellers and? Uh, uh, um, wasn't Dudley Moore on that? No, too? Dudley Moore was not on that. Oh. Um, was uh, he was he was in the crowd, but he wasn't one of those guys. This was Spike Milligan. Oh. And um, who else? Well, anyway, they used to broadcast those things from London. And I thought they were the funniest things I ever, I ever heard in my life. And um, they, they would listen to that. It looked to me like I'm nuts. <laughs> you know, crazy. So I played on this record. And said, oh, that's awful. You know. But anyway, that's what it was about. Yeah. That was the Salty Dogs. Okay. We have one record we left in you, Testament. You seem to be um, really attracted to. Oh gosh, I don't know if authentic is the right word, but a certain kind of historical thing. Like I know you're very fond of Jelly Roll. Oh yeah, well, I, uh, yeah. I had a choice when I was a kid of when I was first starting to collect records, um, of buying a Count Basie rec uh, uh, album, which had every tub in it. You know, it was mm -hmm. one of Columbia Ten Inches, uh, yeah. three or four to the set, or the Jelly Roll Morton reissue on Green Label Victor. Well, I, the guy would play it you know, very nice in those stores then. He played me a band from each one. He says, what, he, says he advised me to take the Count Basie one, which is about the time it came out, I guess 1946, 47. No. I, at age 11, you know, I, or 12, I instinctively went to the Jelly Roll Morton wow. one. And I wore Deep Creek out till, I was, till, till it turned white, till the green label, actually, the whole record. <laughs> Because wow. that was to me one of the most profound blues recordings ever made. Mm -hmm. You know if you're familiar with that? I don't think so. Deep Creek. Was that Leon Rapolo on no, that? No, no, no. This is Jelly Roll Morton. I know that, but who was Well it was it was a, it was one of his not very good later bands, but it had Procope. Oh. Procope played, I think, uh, um, Paul, Paul Barnes played the soprano solo. Uh, Procope played the clarinet solo. Uh, but it was just that the bass, the bass sustained uh, and just, uh, notes in the regular 12 bar blues, the tuba played long tones. Mm -hmm. And after every chorus, they upped it a fourth. Oh. And then another solo instrument would come. And Jolly Rob all had it going so that it just kept moving, you know, rhythmically in the background <coughs> while in front of the solos and about up. up. It was one of the most profound records I ever heard in my life. Wow. In other words, like there are ser several things, you know, how, well, what did you learn to play the blues? Well, you learn to play the blues by feeling the blues, one. But to play them, if you want to hear real blues, I mean, it's like listening to Back to the Land with Lester Young and King Cole and, and Buddy Rich, that trio record. Mm -hmm. th there's a perfect example of gr the greatest blues playing of all time. This was an example to me of great blues playing Deep Creek with Jelly Roll Morton. Probably about 1930, I would reckon that was made. Uh, another example of, of great blues playing influenced me 
um, was P.B. Russell playing the last time I saw Chicago with Joe Sullivan and Zooty Singleton. You want to learn how to play the blues? You absorb those, those critters. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you'll come up with something. Because mm -hmm. if you can't play a convincing blues, then you can't play the music. Period. It doesn't matter what color you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm curious as to why in this uh, style of music that, that's played at these festivals and parties, there's very few young, younger black musicians playing it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it wasn't really hip for them to uh, want to uh, know this kind of music. I mean, mm -hmm. period. I mean, they claim we appropriated the music. We white folks appropriated their music, which is a lot of shit, because if it wasn't for the white guys who played this kind of music, that music would have died probably after 1930, you know, when blacks th threw up the music, uh, gave it up. just, And they went on to listening to Swing or whatever, you know. and. A lot of the blacks that I played with who were encouraging to me, Dickie Wells, Rex Stewart, uh, Claude Hopkins, uh, Herman Autry, um, numbers and numbers of, of guys who are all gone now, unfortunately. They were the masters. Red Allen, you know, Buck Clayton. These were the guys who, who said, who were helpful and, and encouraging. You play this music, you know, you play it. Along comes, you know, this young guy, and he says that he's going to show everybody how it's supposed to be done all over again, some 40 years after the fact. And he doesn't do a good job of it. I find it actually in his hands, and we know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The music has not really been absorbed. It's not his, he hasn't really dined with the people that uh, he's supposedly or pur purportedly supposedly listened to and digested, etc. He really hasn't dined with them at all. Maybe he had a crust of bread with them, but he really hasn't spent really devouring um, the people that he proclaims, you know, to have. We're going to show everybody how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Well, not in my book. Okay. It's crap. And we who really believed the music have been just sort of like pushed out of the scene, period. Fine. You know, I resent it, but I don't give a shit. I'm old enough to know what I do, and there ain't nobody out there that does what I do. And there may be somebody out there that does what I do, and doesn't do what I do, but does what he does as good as me, or maybe not as good as me, mm -hmm. or better than me. You know, but he ain't going to do what I do. So that's where this whole thing about um, all these tributes and all this kind of stuff, you know, a tribute to, I really despise that. I think that that's a, a crock. It's a, uh, they won't let you be who you are. They want you to <coughs> hide behind, you know, somebody else and make them the reason why you're all coming to this story, this party, to, to hear the music of Fats Waller, or the music of this week, Bi Big Spiderbeck will be on. Next week, oh man, it's going to be Louis Armstrong. Oh, the Kid Ori night is uh, on Thursday. Oh, really? You know, it's sort of like, and really, all of a sudden, the, how are you going to get individual voices if, if, you're, if you're forcing people into repertory, mm -hmm. where you're literally trying to make them sound like somebody else other than themselves? Not that everybody wants, wants to be themselves. You know, because there isn't, not a lot of people don't, don't have self. You know, they're comfortable right. being uh, other people, yeah. you know, putting a different hat on. And Certain people have made almost a career out of is, is, yes. being close. Right. Or clones. Or clones. Little dollies. Hello, dolly. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Well, you're, you're a guy who I can always count on for an opinion. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure I rambled on much no. more than you ever wanted no. me to ramble on. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> I guess, you know, you look at the, the jazz scene today, and um, 
there's some things that are really positive. It's been elevated to a real art form. But I wonder who wants it. Where where are these where are the people where are the people with the originality? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some good ones out there. You know, there's Chris Potter, there's Joe Lovato, there's um, Billy Charlop. You know, I mean, they all know their deficiencies. Incidentally, you know, I mean, I mean, at least Billy has admitted. Like, I, I said, look, when I placed on a sunny side of the street, I've heard at least 25, 30, 40, 50 versions of that tune by different people. He says, yes. He says, I know. He says. I haven't heard it really anybody's version of it. Oh. To me, it's C E seven ba ba ba. See, now that's what's missing in all of or most of the players today. That's what's missing out of their playing. They don't have the point of reference. Like you said earlier, monk, that I went back to listen to you know, Jolly or whatever. Yeah, I was. We, I used to hang with Steve Lacey when I was a kid. You know. And we went, I, I told him, I raved about this guitar player out in Queens, and I said, you got to hear this guy play, he's really... And so I said, well, let's go hear him. So we went out, and this, this guy, he said, you like him? I said, yeah. He says, he ain't much. I said, if you really like him, why don't you listen to who he listened to? I said, who's that? He said, Django Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. So there you had it. From, that's where I said, oh. So when you hear somebody, you say, where is he out of? Then you go back and catch the person who, or, or, or several persons that that person has heard, and you go back and you trace it down to the to the beginning, if there is such a thing, mm -hmm. you know, because everybody learns from this, everybody. But that's what I mean. Who did you dine with? Eh? If you don't have that in your playing, well, then you got roux. I mean, you don't have roux. You haven't got gumbo. You got gumbo soup. <laughs> Thank you, Ken I can tell you. Can you <laughs> now, I see. I promised I wasn't going to ask about it. I told you I wasn't going to ask about it, but... <laughs> That's the idea of Iron Man. I mean, I wouldn't come down. Well, Rue. There's a chapter in the first, in the first one. It's called R-O-U-X. And it actually says, and there he is. Cute as a, cute as, cute as a, as a button, you know. Now, you can have all kinds of ingredients. You're going to make a gumbo, see? But you can have them all in there. But if you don't have roux, you don't have gumbo. You have gumbo soup. Skip, skip, dabba, doopy, doop, boop, Oh, God. And from then on, he just, every time he got into the, when well, the talking heads kept going around, isn't that right, Sally? Oh, indubitably. And, <laughs> and Gary Giddy. Well, he held the same intensity of the emotions as for Charlie Parker with the exact same amount of platitudes as he did for Louis Armstrong. He made them sound like he was talking yeah. about the same, he made them mm -hmm. sound like he was about the same person. Yeah. <sighs> talking heads. Well, listen, as long as we're on a few people, I wanted to ask you your maybe just reactions to a couple names I'll give to you. Mm. Uh, we only touched on Pee Wee Russell. Yeah. What did, touch some more on Pee Wee Russell. What was it about him that uh, was unique? Or maybe he wasn't. It was very unique. Yeah. You, can, you know, anytime you want to hear somebody try to sound like him, it's laughable because you know who they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, you know instantly they're trying to uh, mock, well, they're not really mock, but if you're trying to do Pee Wee, and I know somebody here who does him very well, but at the same time, I can't take this playing seriously enough because he's doing Pee Wee, and only Pee Wee could do Pee Wee. You know, a lot of guys try to do Louis Armstrong, and they ended up really uh, uh, becoming themselves, whether it's Louis Prima or Louis Prima or Harry James or Bunny Bergen or whoever, you know, or Roy Eldridge or, or, or Joe Thomas or, you know, all the guys that were influenced by Louis, including Rex Stewart, too, you know, because he even tried to dress like him. Or Vic Dickinson, who tried to do Louis on his, on his, on his trombone. Well, I mean, Louis is a, was a great teacher, but, I mean, you also brought out your own individuality. You can hear 20 trumpet players from that, that era, and all 20 of them sound different. Today, you get all 20 trumpet players who try to sound like Clifford Brown, and they do. And it's difficult to know one from the other, you see? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the individuality is gone. Okay, what about P.B. Russell? He was so such an individualist, he was inimitable. You could not copy him. 
without everybody else knowing what you were doing, I'm just making you laugh. Like, oh, that's <laughs> great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, this fool is doing poo. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not even not to be considered. You know. Okay. Uh, Ruby Braff. Ruby is a very, very strong individual player. Known him a long time, and on and off, you know. I mean, um, very humorous. Well, sense of humor. Loves mm -hmm. to hold court. Does, and um, an unsung hero in a way. I mean, yeah. among people that know know that he's a very individual. Uh, within four bars, you know it's him. Mm -hmm. Just, he's got his own signature, so to speak. That's a big, strong point in a world of millions and millions of clones and sound-alikes to be able to tell a person within four bars, oh, that's so-and-so. I mean, that's yeah, amazing feat to be able to do that. Right. How about John Coltrane? Well, I've never really cared for his playing. Mm -hmm. You know, I never cared for his sound. I can, under I can appreciate him more now than I could when he first came out. I just never, there was a, you know, like bebop to me, it was a language that was trying to cut guys like me off or out of the picture. Whatever it was, it didn't concern me. It was not my lingua franca. I will still hold that to be true today. That anybody trying to do that or play that kind of music who's not from that era or with those, or, or descendant of that era of people, then they, they're outsiders. Sorry. Hmm. There's some people, jazz, uh, who teach it, who feel like jazz started with John Correct, Coltrane. certainly. Uh, those poor fools haven't got a clue, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to teach jazz, you take it back to when it was teach, when it's able to be, where it's able to be taught from and, and when it's the most understandable, when it was still part of the popular culture where the, where the kids uh, were, were, you know, that was their music. Mm -hmm. They were the rebels who their parents looked at that kind of music. Oh, that's awful, dreadful jazz music. You know, it's, uh, even Miles Davis's parents, you know, like didn't condone jazz music. It was the devil's music. It was this kind of music brought on sexual, whatever fantasies come mm -hmm. true, uh, mm -hmm. along with the forbidden weed. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, they're the tunes that I'm talking about. That I mean, uh, that 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 the kids could identify with. They're the same kids with the same mentality today who are who listening to the same, unfortunately not the same music, but the same tribal energy that used to go up making 16 men in a band perform like one. You got four guys plugged into uh, amplification that can fill up, you know, the Yankee Stadium with this horrendous mm -hmm. uh, tribal music and caused the same kind of frantic uh, uh, thing that, that they did in 1938 or 1928. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Nothing has changed. Because if man learned from history, he wouldn't be repeating the same stupidities, would he? He's still doing it, though. <laughs> How about uh, Elvis Presley? Well, I mean, I look at him now. I look at him now, and I, you know, I almost shed a tear. But when he first came out, I remember I was working with Tony Spargo, who was the original drummer with the original Dixieland Jazz Band, right? And he says, he says, "Oh, you all are just jealous." He had a southern New Orleans accent. You all are just jealous of him because he's got such a pretty face. But I mean, when he first came out, I didn't think very much of his music at all. In fact, we hated it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was gyrations and obscene, and there we are, very. Very staid guys, you know. We're going to play play the music correctly and properly, you know. And what he was doing was sort of obscene. Then after him came the Beatles. That was the end of it. And I think there's a, one of these crazies had said, oh, "It was Abby Lincoln. I saw her on it. The Beatles were were brought to America by by the Brits to undermine black the black man's uh, music and economy. That's deep shit, boy. And I, I heard that on a jazz show." Ken Burns presents jazz. Uh, <laughs> that was done with, um, uh, that was, uh, I think it was Abby Lincoln that said that. Oh, yeah, I remember, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. She, that she accused yeah. the oh, Brits of, of, of sending these guys over to kill the black market for R&B? Conspiracy theories. 
Yeah, they do abound. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I mean, there's so much that you could talk about. Only thing is, it's such a drag because nobody really, maybe they'll care about it in a hundred years or whatever, these things. Maybe. So, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, if anybody really cares to listen to it, but it's just so sad to see the whole thing ending. Instrumental music as we know it. To stay home and practice your instrument and go try to get a beautiful sound and articulation and play music that that you can experience with other guys on the bandstand, which I don't find happening anymore either, you know? To find a trade-off of ideas and and, 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 and just like conversational around, or, or, you know, it's so rare, you know, to have fun and try to, 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 to make musical conversation. Mm -hmm. But there's no feeling like it when it's happening. None like it. I mean, when you're dancing, it doesn't matter what the chords, it doesn't matter, nothing matters. It's just that you are dancing with that, with, with, and you, you can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. And every interval has, you know, it's a very rare thing, but once it's happened to you, you're hooked. And that's what jazz music means to me. <laughs> <laughs> the music swells up behind us. Nice statement. Just to wrap up here, I want to, um, no tears. No. <laughs> but uh, I have to comment on your um, use of high notes on the clarinet. Mm. That I have noticed, in my humble opinion, that they always have a purpose to me. Shouldn't they have a purpose? They should. <laughs> they certainly should. <laughs> yeah. But I was, you know, like last night, you hit one, and it was, it was beautiful in itself, but... It went even higher. It it was like not the end in itself. It wasn't just like I'm going to hit this note because I know the fingering. No. It had a purpose. Well, it was to end the tune. You know, uh, I'd rather end the tune high than low. You know, uh, but also it was a C above C concert, mm -hmm. and um, and that would be the root of the chord. Yeah, but I think it was even before that. It was in your solo, and you hit this really quite high note, and but it wasn't. I don't know. I'm not. I can't even put it into words. But it was, it was a very musical moment. Rather well, than shouldn't just, it all be music without well, that high or should. low? You it know. Should, I, mean, but it I mean, it's part of my lingua franca, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. I like that. My lingua franca. I got that. Little, <laughs> we got that from Dick Wellston. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Yeah. I'm gonna put this on for you. Ah, the hot three. No, the blue three. The blue three. Bobby Rosengarten, Dick Wellston, yeah. and uh, yours truly, 1981. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, we could play. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's we could, real good. Well, he was. I was. I once asked um, Joe Venuti what happened how, after how he felt after Eddie Lang died, and he said it was like half of me died. Mm. Well, when Wellstead died, yeah, I felt that yeah. way. That's something to sustain a band like that too without a bass player, I think. Oh, we were brilliant, you know, we really enjoyed I mean, I, I made, a, I made a, a conscious effort to to play trios. So, mm -hmm. you know, with, I did one, a trio with Art Hodes and yep. Don DeMichael. Then they died. <laughs> and I had one with Ralph Sutton and Gus Johnson. And Gus Johnson died. Uh, then I did one with Dick Wellstead and Bobby Rosengarten, and Dick died. Uh. And then, uh, you, know, I've, I've, you know, but after a while, like, so I, I switched to guitars. <laughs> and they're all alive. <laughs> In fact, we're going to do it tonight, yeah. you know. Yeah. The, the reason the long group, you know. I'll have, I'll have fun with that, because, you know, Howard Alden can read my mind. Bucky plays non parallel rhythm. Nobody plays better than him. Isn't that uh, something? How right, he Tony Nicola is my favorite drummer, because he really 
takes me home. And um, and Greg Cohen is just just a very intuitive, deep, deeply rooted musician who's heard and, and cares. He cares. What, uh, the story I'll tell you about, uh, speaking of caring, I once drove to, when I was 16 years old, I drove to the Hotel New Yorker at 10.30 at night, parked my car on the street, which you could do then. I painted in my mustache and wore my double-breasted suit and shirt and tie, and I'm walking in the door, and this, this goon who's standing at the door says, Yeah, kid. And I said, Oh, oh I, I want to see Mr. Rolini. Adrian Rolini, mm -hmm. who was playing vibes with his trio at Adrian's Tap Room, which at that time was at the Hotel New Yorker on the corner, 34th and 8th. Andrews was right there. I had acquired that very day two bass saxophone pads from uh, his original bass saxophone that was in the shop where I used to go to get my horn worked on it, on 48th, that's 48th Street. And when I looked over and I, up at Freddie Davis's, you know, repair shop, and I saw this great big, beautiful silver ba con bass saxophone sitting on a mandrel, I said to Freddie, I said, whose is that? He said, it's Adrian Rolini's. No kidding. What are you going to do with the pads? He said, we'll go throw them away. I said, well, can I have the B flat and E flat? He said, well, sure. He said, I said, wait a minute, Freddie. I said, I'll take the middle G. And I knew that the middle G was played all the time, but the low B flat, not all the time. He said, I, I, this thing about it. I had just come out to Big Spiderbeck with the Rolini bass saxophone playing, which I thought was uh, non parallel just the greatest thing I ever heard. So now I'm on walking into this this place, and this goon is, uh, what do you want, kid? I want to see Mr. Rolini, who's just kind of, you know, he looked at his watch, and he said, sit over there at that table, kid. Went, okay, I thought I could pass. Obviously, I failed. But anyway, I'm sitting at the table. Rolini is just finishing up. Six people in the joint, six people. Rolini gets off the stand, he's walking sort of dejectedly toward the door. I said, Mr. Rolini? He says, yeah. And I reach in my pocket and I said, you know what these are? And I handed him the bass saxophone pad. And he looked at it, he says, where'd you get these? And I said, from Freddie Davis's. He says, well, what are you doing with them? I said, well, I said, I really loved what you played when you played with the Big Spider back. I thought your playing was just superb. Goose pimples and jazz band ball and we're all gone. And he grabbed hold of the chair, and tears came to his eyes, and he said, I didn't think anybody cared anymore. And he signed it to me, to Kenny, sincerely, Adrian, and the date. I got that pad in there. That's great. Yeah, had the original shellac on the back and the whole thing, yeah. But there, see, he had given up, you know, he just turned really sour about it. Everything. Uh -huh. They found him a few years later uh, murdered. Uh, it was a mob I didn't know that. rub out. Yeah, he was a heavy, inveterate gambler, and he was into them for a lot of money. And I guess they called, they called the you know called in their their tokens, and uh, he couldn't do it. And they found him, oh, dear. The, you know, legs broken and all that, and a ditch in. Uh, in one of the creeks in, uh -huh. uh, on the east side, east wow. coast of Florida. Well, this has been fascinating. Just a mere bag of shells. <laughs> I am, you're a ball to talk to. I'm sorry I rambled on so much. I, know, I think you must have had more coaching no, things to ask No, me. I didn't, actually. I, uh, I was going to ask you about your fondness for sound men, but... Unsound men. <laughs> unsound men. There's a funny That's story. That's why there's no energy. That's what? That's why there's no energy oh. anymore. No one has to right. put out. That's right. If they're not putting out, someone like puts it out for them. That's right. Yeah. Don't worry, you just stand and play your horn. Come on. No energy. Yeah. There's I remember Well stood there, he was doing one of these, you know, and, and then when I'd come in, he'd go. <laughs> I find it. I said, what are you doing, man? I said, okay. he said, oh, what? You want me to provide the energy for you? He says, create your own fucking energy, motherfucker. 
<laughs> All right. But he managed to do that anyway. Yeah. He knew better than that. You know, it was a joint effort. I mean, you don't pull the ball, you don't pull the <laughs> thing out from underneath you. When you get finished, you do this and you, the guys, then you stop and you say, you got it. <laughs> That's not fair. You know, I wouldn't be right at all. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs>